great pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Kay Anderson. Kay did her PhD at UBC in 1987, um, has travelled traveled widely in her intellectual career, uh, spent some time as a professor in um, the Durham in the UK, and is now a professorial research professor at the Institute of Culture and Society at the University of Western Sydney, which she started in 2003. She is a, a, the winner of numerous awards, and we're delighted to say member of this journal's editorial board, which is the best award. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce Kay, as she has been an important figure for me personally. When I was doing my PhD, I started to read Kay's early work on race, hegemony and landscape in Vancouver, in Vancouver's Chinatown, which became one of the classic pieces of theoretically informed cultural geography associated with what was then called the new cultural geography. I think we probably need to stop calling it that at some point. Um, none of us feel that new anymore, I guess. Um, and the work that she was doing then uh, around issues of race was one of the important thing, um, moments, I think, in the way in which geographers have handled race and, and can be added to the list of um, incredible people that Audrey Kawayashi was talking about the other day in principle. Um, her paper in Society and Space on Cultural Germany and the Race Definition Process in Vancouver's Chinatown from 1988 remains one of the very best papers from those early years of the new cultural geography that became the impetus for our journal. And I've taught this paper to over 20 years of undergraduate students. And I know that that's been replicated in many places across the world as a key text for explaining to people um, how uh, important and how um, careful cultural geography with a theoretical, theoretically informed cultural geography can be. Um, I had a particularly fond memory uh, of, uh, of somewhere around 20 years ago of meeting Kay uh, at an AAG conference in San Diego and chatting about hegemony and culture while sitting by the swimming pool at an AEG conference, I think she had a, a, a sore throat at the time, and um, was probably somewhat distracted by this strange person talking to her, but I, I was thrilled, and um, I think I was probably quite starry-eyed at the time because I'd been reading her work. Um, an important thing about Kay is she never rested on her laurels. Uh, it didn't, she's continued to do exactly the same thing uh, since she started. She's continued to push cultural geography and the ideas that are central to her work um, in, her, in her research to push beyond um, what you might expect and, um, and to push the discipline in new directions. So for instance, um, her work on um, cultures of nature uh, in Adelaide Zoo was another classic uh, paper that um, informed the way in which cultural geography dealt with nature and the relationship between culture, nature and the emerging work on culture, natures and animal geographies. Um, she obviously has published an enormous amount of things that have been very important in the pedagogical sense as well. I also remember inviting, uh, sorry, inventing places, inviting places that yet to be written, someone could try that. Uh, inventing places, which is one of those edited collections that were very important to students and, and researchers who were beginning to engage with these ideas at, the, at that time. There were a number of books that came out, um, with a, which were very exciting to those of us who were working. At that time, I was going to end up my PhD, but I know it was one of the very important books. And of course, she's also the, one of the editors of the um, 2000 Two, was it, I think, Handbook of Cultural Geography, which also became a defining uh, text, I think, in a different way, not necessarily for undergraduate students, but um, uh, defining the cutting edge of what cultural geography was then. And her work since then has been um, um, engaging with ideas of, of what the human in human geography is, uh, what it is to be, what, what, what human means. Um, they're very serious uh, ontological questions, moral questions and epistemological questions about race and about the human um, in relation to Aboriginal geographies in Australia and in relation to the history of science and in relation to any number of other things. Um, and the second monograph um, uh, would start to develop some of those themes and I think um, they, they continue to develop and I think that's what we're going to hear about today. So without much further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Kay Anderson and um, uh, welcome her. Thank you. 
Um, but today my, the work is growing out of um, a project with the Australian Research Council, a discovery grant that's been running for a couple of years now. I had to lean close to the microphone, though, didn't I? <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I won't, repeat, I won't repeat my introduction, but I will mention to Tim I still have a sore throat um, all, these years, all these years later, um, but doubtlessly to do with some long haul travelling. Um, okay, today, uh, my lower matter on decentering the human in human geography. As the uh, philosopher Simon uh, Glendini um, puts it in his critique of humanism, uh, in the same universalist terminology that he criticises, and I quote, man is only man insofar as he is essentially more than a human animal. Unlike animals, whose lives are defined solely by their existence, human beings are or become human as they transcend some animal-like condition. That's the end of the quote. It's this formidably tenacious and in the early decades of the 21st century, patently dangerous idea in Western-derived cultures that humans are in some sense irreducible to nature that I want to take up in this paper. And it does so against the background of what is a now widespread concern within the social sciences and the humanities to challenge the long-standing assumption that some realm of human culture can be conceived as separate from another non-human domain called nature. Challenging the idea that humans occupy a separate and privileged place among other beings has been a central goal of what is now a familiar post-humanist agenda in geography. An agenda inspired above all, perhaps by Bruno Latour and others, notably Donna Haraway in Science and Technology Studies and in Actor Network Theory. It's an agenda that has been particularly influential for a discipline of geography long divided as it has been by an always uncomfortable distinction between the human and the physical. In geography, Noel Castry and Catherine Nash note that the term post-humanism has been used both to describe a historical condition and to signal a theoretical perspective. So descriptively then, post-humanism has come to name the sense in which recent developments in biotechnology, our increased dependence on machines, the multiplication of hybrid objects and so on have meant that our lives have become now so thoroughly entangled with all kinds of non-humans that it's become difficult, if not impossible, uh, to delimit a distinctively human form of being. Conceptually, post-humanism has centred more on the challenge that these sociological developments have posed to the stability and the category, the, sorry, the stability and the integrity of the category of the human. More specifically, as Castry and Nash put it, it has challenged the very idea of the quote, human subject as separate and liberated from nature and fully in command of self and non-human others. End of quote. The central goal of this critical post-humanism, as I want to take it up and, de and develop it further in this paper, is to challenge that deeply entrenched discourse of humanism that separates and elevates humans from the natural world. It's a challenge designed to affect, in the words of Australian cultural studies scholars Gay Hawkins and Emily Potter, a decentering, as they call it, of the thinking human subject. A decentering that increasingly in human geography, as elsewhere, has been pursued by what uh, Sarah Watmore in this context uh, back in 2006 has described as a recuperation of materiality. This recuperation is evident in a range of distinct but related developments. Acknowledging the proliferation of work in the ongoing task of re-materialising cultural geography, it's possible to discern a few clusterings as follows. First, around material culture studies of, for example, the intersections of matter, memory and place. Second, the move to reclaim the social, especially in social geography, a move to reclaim the social in an intensified focus on material inequalities, 
Third, the non-representational turn to bodily practices and um, the effective economies, as they're called, of touch, taste, smell and sound. Also, sense and sensibility in recent, as they are called, post-human phenomenologies. And finally here, a nature cultures cluster sharing various vitalist philosophies with non-representational geography to elicit the entangled materialities of nature, science, and technology. These engagements with materiality, they're now so disparate and disputed as to now be the subject themselves of uh, major reviews, including one that uh, an editorial board member, Scott, has recently produced. These, these engagements with the material have been now um, so, so extensive and, and disputed and disparate that they've now warranted uh, major reviews and have indeed transformed decisively the ground of a cultural geography once characterised as all too human. It's the nature culture's agenda within a broader, more than human geography, as it's called, that has arguably done most to challenge a cultural geography whose ontological gates, once enclosed, are taken for granted domain of culture and the human. To cite just a few of its focal points, it has included studies of soybeans, dust mites, flu viruses, companion species, the cow too as another instance of domestication, of wheat, the biopolitical capacities of water, the countless non-human entities and organisms that compose urban life, the elemental rather than ineffable properties of air, the microbes that make up our more than human bodies, the inventiveness of bacteria, nematodes too, and, and so on. In uncovering the agency of non-humans and in describing what is an enlarged and relational conception of life itself, these broadly materialist moves have elicited culture as, in the words of Tim Creswell's review, a world of humans with plus. Culture, as Castrian Nash put it, is always in excess of the human. This analytical and ethical ambition to break out of a narrow and humanist conception of culture is one that this paper shares, as it too aims to problematise the idea that humans constitute a somehow distinct category of beings. In this regard, the attention given to the formerly neglected lives of non-human animals in the field of animal geography since its reanimation in the mid-1990s has been a guiding ethical compass for the work which informs this um, work today, this talk today. That said, and to try and help position the rather different post-humanist strategy of decentering the human that I want to pursue today, and more specifically to frame the historical considerations that form the substantial part of this paper, I take my point of departure um, from the spate of materialist efforts to bracket off that meaning-making subject to whom mind, creativity and power had once been solely attributed. It's a bracketing off, I'll suggest, that has tended to foreclose an adequate engagement with the specific idea in Bruce Braun's neat description of the particular figuration of the human as something more than a human animal. I take this phrase to bracket off from Jane Bennett's influential manifesto, Vibrant Matter. And there what is bracketed off is, and I quote, what is commonly taken as distinctive or even unique about humans, end quote. In the introduction to their collection, New Materialisms, Diana Kuhl and Samantha Frost write that it was Descartes who identified the, quote, thinking human subject as ontologically other than matter, end quote, such that modern philosophy has variously portrayed humans as, to further quote, uniquely rational, self-aware, free and self-moving agents. For Bennett, this conception of the human as ontologically other than matter is bound in her words, and I quote, to fantasies of human uniqueness in the eyes of God, end of quote. And it's in its bracketing off that human and non-human actants can be regarded as coexisting on the same level 
So as the editors of another recent volume in this area, Dolphin and Van der Tuen observe, it's precisely in the rejection of a Christian or Cartesian metaphysics that this so-called new materialism is not dualist, but, they say, monist, in its assertion that humans and non-humans exist on a single material plane. Clearly then, it's the idea of humanity's ontological distinctiveness that the proposition of human and non-human coexistence on a single material plane is set against. This, of course, indisputable proposition of coexistence offers a valuable corrective to Cartesian dualism and with it the idea that humans are unique possessors of some immaterial soul or mind. But an issue I want to raise here concerns the understanding, and it's an understanding that I think has been accepted if sometimes only tacitly or by default in materialist geographies, of humanism as an immaterialism, of, to be clear, humanism itself as a more or less Christian or Cartesian doctrine. From this identification of humanism with a Christian or Cartesian metaphysics, Human exceptionalism then, as that separation between active human subjects and um, inactive, uh, passive non-human objects, is usually traced, traced back to the uncritical premise that humans are ontologically distinct. Now the implications of this mode of critique, the critique that is of ontological dualism, have been quite far-reaching for current rethinkings of the human in human geography. Not least are they evident in the tendency to turn away from those aspects of culture conventionally regarded as distinctly human, of, for example, intersubjective meaning, symbolising and knowing. These are aspects that tend now to be annexed, as if they fall outside of a geographic concern with our material existence. And how else, if not, according to an ontological critique, of metaphysical conceptions of the human to apprehend the logic of a recent turn in cultural geography, one in which a supposed unique order of reason, mind or consciousness, in Val Plumwood's words, has been opposed, more or less term for term, by an affirmation of the sensory, bodily and affective character of human life. The strain signalled here in this manoeuvre should not be taken as a criticism as such of the affective and bodily turns in cultural geography, including, um, I would add here, to feminist engagements with the lived body, ecologies of the body too. Far from it. In the field of materialist engagements with race, for a, for a too quick example here, there's now rich evidence in cultural geography of just how much the idea of race as knowledge that I once wrote about, the idea of race of, as knowledge, as classification, as meaning system, how much that approach to race actually leaves out in terms of how race is lived, how it's sensed, how it's felt, and indeed emerges in materialities of encounter. How much, too, the conventional research methods of critiquing racial representation fail to tune into, in Lorimer's words, I should say Jeremy, because I can see, uh, Jamie, because I can see him, uh, how much these conventional research methods of critiquing racial representation, how they fail to tune into, and in Nigel Swift's words, even deaden the bodily surfaces and intensities that produce race in interaction. But to return to my focus here on the more than human tactic, that sets humanism as fantasy or as immaterialist aside and then it proceeds logically and politically to recuperate matter. Some more immediate questions for me arise. Can humanism be so readily excluded from the material? I'll come back to that in a moment. And does the materialist opposition to what is an essentially theological idea of humanism offer the best hope of challenging contemporary assumptions, assumptions today, that is, of human exception from nature. For just in historical terms, is it really the case that the still lingering idea today of human exception from nature draws only, or even largely, 
on Christian or Cartesian notions of the human. That is, is it really the case, as Bruno Latour himself has maintained, that we humans in Western-derived cultures, and I quote him, haven't moved an inch since Descartes, such that 500 or so years later, as Latour goes on to lament, and I quote again, the human mind is still in its vat, excised from the rest, disconnected and contemplating the world, end of quote. As if then some doctrine or ideology of human exception from nature has just persisted despite Darwin, to quote Lynn White's historical roots of our ecological crisis, as if human exceptionalism has just endured throughout or somehow outside of history as some kind of archaic metaphysical belief. In responding to these questions, the approach I take up in the next part of the paper turns out to be modestly empirical as it attempts to interject into a current post-humanist agenda consideration of the history of the idea of human exception from nature. The episode of this history that I want to consider here, moreover, addresses how, at the very beginning of the 19th century, the idea of an immaterial soul or mind wasn't just carried along as blind fantasy, but instead was actively rejected and indeed was supplanted via a set of scientific practices that offered a new account of precisely the physical distinctiveness of human beings. Here then I take up the demise of Descartes' account of the human and of what was more generally considered to be its exalted place in the so-called great chain of beings, the demise of which impelled a new attempt to establish the human's exceptional status. A new, modern form of humanism, it was to become influential to today, perhaps far more influential, I'll suggest later, than its Christian or Cartesian predecessors. To anticipate this account, the comparative anatomists of the early 19th century physically distinguished human beings by asserting the uniquely upright nature of the human body and with it the verticality of the human head. And it will be suggested it was through the various practices of craniometry and centrally the practices of racial craniometry that these scientists attempted to establish an, an anatomical account of humans as creatures that were categorically different from all other animals, especially the great apes. Of course, the emergence of comparative anatomy at the beginning of the 19th century, as well as evolutionary theory later on, attracted a good deal of hostility from those especially Christian commentators who continued to insist that humans were ontologically distinct from non-humans. But again, to assume that human exceptionalism just persisted despite these developments and because of some inexorable human vanity or naive Christian faith is to overlook the history of what was actually an anxious struggle to establish the exceptional status of the human without recourse to Cartesian metaphysics. It's this anxious struggle and its legacy into the present that will be considered here. And while this instance, uh, this struggle I should say, might perhaps be read as yet another instance in the systematic elaboration of a metaphysical notion of soul or mind, there are good reasons to avoid an assumption of humanism's seamless continuity. For to assume this continuity is to risk construing the very idea of human exception from nature as something outside of history, as a belief that could somehow persist behind its various formulations, as a kind of underlying motivating ideology that could exist apart from or prior to its various and of course always material manifestations. The important point here then is that it's only by insisting upon humanism's own materiality, by pursuing a critique based upon its worldliness rather than its otherworldliness, that is, as something which is assembled in the concrete literal sense that Latour, for example, has opposed to the linguistic idea of social constructivism, that human exceptionalism can itself be rendered vulnerable. Only then by recognising humanism's 
very materiality, can it be, become susceptible to precisely the intensity of scrutiny demanded by the Earth's state of ecological fragility. Setting aside as abstraction, as myth, the notion of human exception from nature isn't then arguably enough to decenter it in the interest of a planet under pressure. As Joanna Burke has observed, to understand the instability of definitions of the human, we need history. And so it is in my attempt then from a southern positioning in one of our post-colony to elicit the instability of human uh, exceptionalism itself, that what I want to consider now is its uneasy formulation by a specific notion of intelligence. Intelligence then perhaps as um, the iconic humanist marker of distinction from the non-human, one that gets left unproblematized in the existing post-humanist gesture, which is to bracket off the thinking human subject and proceed then to recuperate matter. There's a lot then that gets left out and unproblematized in that story. Forged in the notorious practices of racial craniometry, it was a notion that I'll be suggesting was integral to the emergence of what my Australia Research Council co-researcher Colin Perrin and I call a discourse of anatomical humanism. Surely, Linnaeus wrote in the margins of his, his Systema Natura, Descartes never saw an ape. By which Linnaeus was alluding to the discovery of the great apes from around the middle of the 17th century that turned the massive gulf Descartes had previously asserted between humans and animals into a problem. Linnaeus' infamous assertion that he could find no physical way to categorically distinguish between humans and the great apes was premised upon his assumption that orangutans, a general term at the time, walked upright. By the beginning of the 19th century, however, this claim was called into question. For the comparative anatomists of this period, it was uprightness or bipedalism that came to be understood as a distinctively human trait. And although it was the head that con constituted their primary focus, it was by relating cranial development to human uprightness that they sought to produce an account of human exception without invoking, as Linnaeus and other 18th century naturalists had done, a Cartesian separation of mind from body. <clears throat> Importantly then, the concern of those like George Cuvier in France and William Lawrence in England to found an anatomical account of, the human, of human exception did not amount to conceiving the human body, and more specifically, the human head, as just the vat for an essentially immaterial conception of mind after Descartes, or as soul, dating further back to Judeo-Christian theology. And it was precisely in the attempt to demonstrate that human mentality was a product of bodily structure that arose that great 19th century obsession with the head and most notoriously the collection and measurement of human skulls. Limiting attention here to that aspect of human mentality considered as distinguishing humans from other animals. It was head size and head shape which, taken as a reflection of the size of the brain, became a measure of the quality of this mentality. For the most part, this quality came to be referred to as intelligence. <coughs> and as Elizabeth Williams has pointed out, this came to be understood over the course of the 19th century as an innate but variable faculty of civilizability or perfectibility. In his consideration of how intelligence and its synonyms were created, John Carson's 2007 The Measure of Merit notes that from the mid-18th century, intelligence was made to stand, and I quote, for whatever general intellectual power made white male Europeans obviously more civilised and advanced than Ethiopians or Hottentots, not to mention other animal species, end of quote. 
Intelligence then for Carson became discursively and politically defined as that intellectual power according to which Europeans were considered superior to other races. And importantly here, it was this same power that also distinguished, though I emphasise here unproblematically so for Carson, humans from other animals. Carson's argument echoes a now very familiar identity politics critique of the pernicious role of craniometry in turning race into an innate condition. In trying to relate variations in head size and head shape to some intellectual capacity or incapacity, Carson argues that the comparative anatomists of the early 19th century drew on, and I quote, the vision of a hierarchy of species associated with the great chain of being and with it the chain's key criterion for distinguishing species and organisms' overall level of intelligence, end of quote. Conventionally, therefore, racial craniometry is understood as appropriating a pre-given concept of intelligence, one that had already provided the basis upon which the human had been distinguished from other animals and granted an exalted position at the top of the great chain of being. Here, however, an alternative or further uh, possibility can be suggested. As Michel Foucault has argued, it was with the transition from the classical to the modern age that, to quote him, the possibility of deploying a great natural order which would extend continuously from the simplest and most inert of things to the most living and the most complex disappears, end of quote. And as Cuvier himself, for example, in the early 1800s maintained in his words, the pretended chain of beings as applied to the whole of creation is erroneous, end of quote. It is then far from clear that comparative anatomists like Cuvier simply drew on and extended the hierarchical principle of life expressed by the great chain. And again, the claim here, as supported by Price's recent uh, piece in The History of the Human Sciences, the claim here is that it was precisely with the demise of the great chain belief system that human distinctiveness came to be understood in new and, after Foucault, specifically modern terms. As Carson has pointed out, which racial groups were superior and which inferior was already known at the beginning of the 19th century. Michael Addis, too, in The Measure of Man, notes that differences in material culture and their perceived levels of sophistication had, by then, come to entrench an, an invidious hierarchy of the world's people. What can be taken from these and many similar critiques of colonialism is that it was precisely because such differences in material culture were taken to form a self-evident intellectual hierarchy, that race came to constitute an essential resource, not only in what we've heard a great deal about in uh, critical race theory and race historiography, so not only then did race come to constitute an essential resource in the violent regimes of colonialism and slavery, about which we've already heard a great deal of criticism and for sound political reasons in geography and elsewhere. Race was also en enrolled, I'm proposing here, and this has been largely neglected, in the attempt to establish a modern successor to the great chain. The existence of a correlation between variations in the anatomical and above all the cranial structure of different peoples and their known level of intellectual inferiority, offered the possibility of a new biological basis for determining a hierarchy among living beings. The point of racial craniometry then was to establish this correlation, precisely by forging an anatomical concept of intelligence, and so to provide a new account of what Cuvier, for example, called that vast difference which separated humans from other animals. Now something of this account of racial craniometry is discernible in that infamous early 19th century practice of head measuring known as phrenology 
phrenology dealing um, more with the, the personality and the character traits that were considered to be located in specific sites within the brain and craniometry concerned more with the conformation of the skull and the brain. The German phrenologist Johann Gustav Spurzheim, for example, maintained that, quote, the heads of different nations offer a study of great importance, precisely insofar as they are able to verify the general assertion of phrenology, that the brain is the organ of the mind, end quote. And comparing what was said to be the conspicuous difference in the forehead of the skull of the painter Raphael with that of a native of New Holland, the Scottish phrenologist George Coombe contrasted the genius of the former with accounts of the ignorance of the, late, of the latter in order to conclude, and I quote, we have now arrived by a fair and legitimate induction at strong presumptive proof in favour of the grand principle of phrenology that the brain is the organ of the mind. Here, however, my main argument focuses not on phrenology as on comparative anatomy, and more specifically on the work of the French zoologist Georges Cuvier from the turn of the 19th century. His work was formative in the more open, invidiously racist uses to which craniometry came to be put across many theatres of empire, notably Samuel Morton's infamous Crania Americana in the late 1830s. But I'll limit my presentation of Cuvier here to an overview. <coughs> Comparative anatomists such as Cuvier and also Lawrence in England are often understood as having considered the human as merely another animal. But despite seeing the human as a purely physical being, Cuvier wrote in his 1802 lectures that, and I quote, the distinction between brute and human mind is absolute, end of quote. Cuvier himself asked, and I quote again, with so much resemblance in the structure of the nervous system, why is there so vast a difference as to the total result between man and the most perfect animal, end quote. <coughs> And it's suggested here, it's exactly in order to answer this question, that Cuvier looked to and developed craniometry in his attempt to formulate not a claim for racial hierarchy as such, but an idea of intelligence that was qualitatively different in beings that walk upright. Man, in Cuvier's words, is the only animal truly by manus and biped, end of quote. <coughs> The mere fact of uprightness, however, cannot account for the vast difference which for Cuvier set the human species apart from all others. Here he turned, as mentioned, to racial craniometry, and granted as an aside here, as I'm sure many of you here would know, early 19th century craniometry extended to a vast um, array of inquiries into you know, not just race, but idios, uh, idiocy, uh, criminality, uh, genius, and just noting also in passing here from a fine uh, study by Elizabeth Fee of 19th century craniometry that it involved almost exclusively male skulls, which was an intriguing bias in itself, um, but it's not one that unfortunately I've been able to take up further here. For it was racial craniometry most diagnostically, and more specifically for Cuvier, Petrus Camper's infamous measure of the facial profile that offered the most promising method for formulating an account of the significance of human uprightness. So just very briefly here, Cuvier argued that the more upright a being was, and the more vertical its facial profile, the larger its brain was in proportion to its senses. With anatomical uprightness then, as indicated by the facial angle, the brain, as in Cuvier's words, the common centre of all the nerves, the instrument by which the mind reflects and thinks, prevails over those two senses of smell and taste, and so of nose and mouth, which act with the greatest force on animals. So just quickly, then, the facial angle, just to give you um, a diagrammatic representation of this. <coughs> 
um, you'll notice the facial angle then gets calculated at the intersection of two lines, the one vertical from the forehead to uh, the chin, in this case the upper jaw, and the one horizontal um, running from the nose through to the ear hole. And you can see from uh, Petra Camper's facial angle diagram here what was um, actually um, in the attempt here was to measure the angle um, and to, I'll, I'll think I'll quickly rush over those to this one because you can see here what was actually trying to be achieved then in studying um, the facial angle um, so that um, the, the, the greater the tilt of the angle then the more tilted the, the facial profile itself and the closer it was assumed to be then to the shape of the facial profile of the ape. Um, and the more upright, the closer then to 90 degrees, um, the farther away then uh, the facial profile of the ape. So for Cuvier then, the facial angle constituted, and I quote here Claude Blanquette's, physi a, a physiological measure of intelligence where intelligence was defined as the extent to which a more basic and animal-like existence has been superseded. And as just mentioned, it was, in, it was in proposing this understanding of intelligence that Cuvier turned to race. He wrote, and I quote, In the various races of man, one observes the same series of relationships as in the various species of animals, between the projection of the skull and that degree of intelligence. Adding immediately, none of the peoples with a depressed forehead and prominent jaws have ever furnished subjects generally equal to Europeans in the faculties of the soul." End quote. And this um, model here of J.J. Vary, who also worked with Petrus Campus um, facial uh, angle, um, he, uh, he developed this uh, depiction here, which I think uh, helps see what the role of race was in uh, this elaboration of human exception, an anatomical conception that I'm, I'm working up here. So, Cuvier, then, it's important to note, wasn't just claiming that those peoples with a depressed forehead and prominent jaws are inferior. He wasn't just claiming that. He wasn't just saying then that the figure identified uh, and number two there in the middle of the diagram, he's not just saying that human number two is inferior to the human depicted at the top of the diagram. As it turns out, this happens to be the figure of the Greek and Roman god Apollo. He's not just saying then that there's an inferiority between the first and the second um, uh, uh, profiles there. Um, after all, in colonial terms, they were already known to be inferior. It's rather the supposed fact of this inferiority that Cuvier is mobilising to try to demonstrate a general anatomical relationship overall. And so from race and across human and ape, to demonstrate a general anatomical link between head shape and intelligence. Cuvier's invocation of an apparently self-evident racial hierarchy thus provides the very basis upon which his comparative research could contend that certain upright anatomies are more intelligent than others. And so it is the very knowledge embedded in colonial stereotypes of non-Europeans that comes to found the far-reaching modern contention that a uniquely human mentality is the product of a uniquely human anatomy. As Cuvier's follower Lawrence in England in his 1819 lectures on physiology um, wrote, and I quote, in the external conformation of man, we immediately remark his upright stature, his majestic attitude, which announces his superiority over all the other inhabitants of the globe. He is the only being adapted by his organisation to go erect. Enslaved to the senses and partaking merely of physical enjoyments, other animals have their heads directed towards the earth." End of quote. And Lawrence too drew on race in his own attempt to demonstrate that, and I quote, the moral and intellectual phenomena of man are the offspring, not of some immaterialist principle, but of physical
organisation. And again, in his words, the different progress of various nations in general civilisation and in the culture of the arts and sciences convince us beyond the possibility of doubt that the races of mankind are no less characterised by diversity of mental endowments than by differences of physical organisation. So, for both Lawrence and Cuvier, among others, the anatomist Thomas Semmering, for example, in Germany, the exceptionality of the human was attributed not to some metaphysical idea of mind, but to the distinctive, if variable, nature of the human body itself. Arguably, then, with these developments, the mind is no longer in its vat. And indeed, if, as Cuvier maintained in his 1817 book, The Animal Kingdom, that intelligence is in constant proportion to the relative size of the brain, this was quite literally because, quoting further here, the more elevated the nature of the animal, the more voluminous is the brain. Yeah.